so first question is just who are you? Uh, can you identify yourself, uh, how you're involved in, in the co-op movement, please? Yeah, so my name is Matthew Epperson. So um, I'm the executive director of the Georgia Cooperative Development Center. Um, yeah, that's my main role. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, so how are you spending your time these days or how are you keeping your peace on a personal level, I guess? Yeah, so I'm thinking a lot about, you know, people who are being more directly impacted than myself. Um, I've been relatively fairly privileged. I've been able to keep going to my regular, you know, kind of work that I do nine to five. Mm -hmm. So I haven't been too much influenced on that level. So I've been thinking a lot about those who, you know, uh, who are definitely like on the front lines um, doing essential work and oftentimes like in the most precarious situations and with the least protections. Mm -hmm. So I try to, th I think a lot about those folks and ways that I can hopefully contribute meaningfully to making this an easier process through this pandemic than it maybe otherwise would be. And I know one thing I've been thinking about too is a lot about the future, of course. So like what will actually happen after the pandemic as well. So how do we organize for that, that future that's coming before too long, hopefully. Yeah. I think that's something that's on all our minds these days for sure. Um, now, just cause I don't know and I'm, I'm curious, the, is there a physical location now for the Georgia Co-op Development Center or have you been working from home like before that anyway? No, yeah, so we were, we've been an all remote uh, virtual center since founding in mid 2017. So that, that part hasn't been a shift for us so much as it seems like it is for everyone else to go remote for pretty much everything. Yeah, and the, the co-ops that you serve, are there a lot of them that are also remote or is it a lot of like brick and mortar stores? It's more brick and mortar, yeah. So we work with like <clears throat> mostly like food related businesses. I've noticed so far like food food co ops in different stripes, mm -hmm. uh, like so, uh, a couple of like startup grocery co ops, also some like worker co ops make different like value added products like vinegar, pecan milk, for example, mm -hmm. and a few yeah farmer co ops as well. So for them, it's definitely it's more of a challenge and a bit strange to be thinking about the digital economy. Uh, not really having to in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Have, have they been hard hit? Have, Cause like obviously grocery co-ops I'm sure are still operating, but like, has, have they been like really badly impacted as far as you can tell? Yeah. So we, we did a survey recently <clears throat> and actually we're still trying to gather as much survey data. So if any Georgia cooperators happen to see this, please send your information. Uh, I can send you the survey link, but um yeah, we did a survey recently and we found that there was about on average about a 45% sales drop for the co-ops that responded. Okay. So that, then that's kind of all over the board. Some people said it was 100%, some people said it was 20%. Um, but yeah, that would be the average. So we've definitely seen some major sales drops, uh, cutting hours, some terminations, um, trying to use stuff like you know, either voluntary leave or like paid time off to try to like cover some of those gaps. Mm -hmm. So our co-ops are doing the best they can, but yeah. there's definitely challenge with that. And we also asked about the question of like, how much cash reserve do you have? Like how long can you kind of sustain yourself where you currently are? Mm -hmm. And the average came back at about uh, 3.5 weeks. So like that's less than a month. <laughs> uh, make sure that my math, yeah. Yeah, most were at uh, under a month, so 57% were at under a month. Yeah. What, what have you guys as a center been doing to, like, support those co-ops? So, yeah, we've so far focused on, like, you know, utilizing the tools we have, so, like, our newsletter and social media to try to, like, get out positive messages about, like, what are the co-ops doing uh, to, like, support each other and what are, like, the resources, like, focusing a lot on course like government resources like a lot of folks I think are focusing on like the uh, EIDL and the PPP as these particular government programs that can be relevant for you know sustaining businesses with their like working capital needs and their payroll needs mm -hmm. um, but also yeah so like you know some of that intercooperative support so like you know when, when like cooperative loan funds like shared capital are trying to like put out there that they're also trying to step into the the support role um, whatever like credit unions are doing to like support their members with, you know, emergency loans, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And still just like showing up with whatever technical assistance they might have, or if they have questions about like, how do they apply for those programs? Trying to be like a resource for them for that. And we've also been leaning a lot on our co-op peers for that. Like NCBA, for example, has done some really great webinars, like informing 
me is hopefully someone who can then help others too uh, about those programs and like um, having the backup of like Kate Latour who does like advocacy work within CBA and, and like also like US Federation of Worker Co-ops has been they were willing to share like their data set about like who all has applied for these programs and like what are their statuses and it's really interesting to see like at like a kind of a, a big picture view of like how the worker co-ops are trying to utilize those programs uh it seems like they are um but they're not actually hearing very much so far back it seems like about <laughs> like really getting the loans and like stop gapping for their situations yeah well it sounds like you guys are doing a lot of really important like coordination work so Thank you. Yeah. Uh, all right. So my next question, have you seen anything inspiring as it relates to cooperation and the solidarity economy during these times? Yeah. So I mean, like some of like the most direct examples I'm familiar with is like, just like the creating of like the masks and, and protective, like personal protective equipment. So like opportunity threads is this uh, Mayan owned worker cooperative in Morganton, North Carolina. So like, seeing them step up to change their production because usually they're making like, you know, other types of textiles, but now they've like totally shifted their production to entirely making, making face masks. Um, and similar with, uh, there's another worker co-op, pretty different type, but it's a, it's an engineering co-op up in Madison, Wisconsin. I was just hearing about how they have changed some of their like machine production and uh, yeah. So like other ways to kind of like shift into shifting production toward personal protective equipment. But more locally, I've um, been talking to like my board member, uh, Eric Simpson, with the West Georgia Farmers Co-op. And a lot of what they're doing right now is like, <clears throat> you know, because part of the, of course, is like the big hit to their sales is that they don't have the restaurants who are buying. But they do still have like such a need from like the school districts, even though there's not actually school in session. So like jumping into still feeding kids, even though schools are closed. So like the West Georgia Farmer Co-op is doing that and like feeding the children of Atlanta where like obviously you know, when they get cut off from, from the farms, they can't last very long. So, you know, they're still as dependent as ever on those farmers and, and really trying to like step into that. Um, and a lot of our co-ops are doing that likewise. And we already touched on like the food co-ops. So like they're kind of shifting the way that they do business. So they're like, you know, they're limiting the ingress and egress into their stores, like how many people can be in there and like, you know, sanitizer everywhere and like cleaning off all of their like carts and hand, like the baskets and, you know, just like really upping the cleaning game. So like, yeah, daily groceries where I used to work, the, the food co-op in Athens, Georgia, they're like really up, they're trying to up their online sales, which I think is pretty cool because they do have like a, like a local delivery service. Um, so they're trying to like really adapt, roll with the changes and yeah, hopefully really fit to this new situation and respond. That's great. That's great to hear about. Um, and I guess I'll move to the last question. Can you describe one fruitful change as it relates to cooperation in the solidarity economy that you think might arise as a result of the pandemic? Yeah, so my, my real hope about this, um, I was just hearing from another a few presenters. I mean, what I love about the opportunity of this moment is that because so much is now online, that there is an opportunity to like connect into other types of co-op work that maybe wasn't previously connecting. So like, I think a lot of people are paying attention to like, in CBA Clusa, but also like um, like the Highlander Center and the Federation of Southern Cooperatives and all these groups that like previously, they're because they're like very in person. Obviously, um, they weren't necessarily connecting as much with each other. And I was just hearing a webinar that was the title was from pandemic to power building. Um, this was um, part of the Center for Economic Democracy did that, and they were talking about like how it is that. You know, you can think about this as a metaphor. This was uh, Gopal Dayaneni with Movement Generation was saying, like, you can think about the coronavirus as like a zero gravity moment. So like, while we're going through this, it's almost kind of like gravity has been suspended. We're kind of like in midair because it's like everything suddenly changed. You know, like you don't have to pay rent right now. Like, when was that a thing? <laughs> you know, but like people understanding and like even making financial systems work with the hardship of dealing with the pandemic. So like the rules are suddenly different. And hopefully like when we're in the zero gravity moment, my hope is that we like reach out to each other and like build bonds that like once the gravity quote unquote comes back, right? And we're going back to whatever business as usual means in this like global capitalist system that we'll come back with greater solidarity than we ever had previously because now we're like seeing what we're all doing and like the ways they're all responding so in somewhat in similar ways to like the needs of our communities. 
and hopefully keep those links going and like continue to do business like intercooperatively. Cause I think the, vi the vision of a cooperative economy, I think a lot of people have that idea, but like <clears throat> the practicality of like, how do you really do that? I think has been thrown into like some amount of like ability to see that almost hopefully, you know, amid these conditions. And I hope we can sustain that uh, continue going forward. So like, if the credit union and the, and the grocery co-op and the worker co-op are all working together for their different pieces of like making sure people are fed, they have personal protective equipment, they have money, you know, all the things that they really need, um, you know, housing, uh, you know, real estate co-ops that are buying up property so that they can, you know, defer rent payments, those types of things. Hopefully like those, those bonds really like come together and get stronger and then they'll be especially strong when the gravity comes back and then we move on. Unfortunately, maybe to the next crisis, but, you know, because we haven't, I think that part of the problem is that we haven't dealt with the underlying crisis, which is really like the way that we do the economy and the way that like we orient profit and people. So until we really deal with that, you know, these other crises will layer on top of what was already there in terms of the crisis that we face. And we'll, I think we'll keep coming back to that. But every time that we face these challenges, I hope that we kind of dig a little deeper into like the real challenge that we're always facing pretty much. Right. Do you, have you noticed or could you say that like any of this, I don't know, imagining of what's coming next has like trickled down to like member levels, especially for, for workers and stuff? Because um, I don't know, it's it's hard when we're all staying indoors to like really know what's, what's going on kind of on the ground and in, in different people's lives. Like I have a concept of like, you know, there's lots of people who are out of work right now and can't, you know, our, our, their financial situation has been has been thrown into question and then there's people who like have more work now because they're working from home and trying to you know understand how to work from home for the first time maybe and like also like deal with just household and, and, and family matters at the same time so you know I've, I'm just wondering how much uh, of this conversation is happening at like the developer level versus like actual members and stuff yeah it's like the members of the of the co-ops themselves <clears throat> it's a really interesting question. And I mean, so part of what we were trying to figure out with our survey also was like, you know, if you were to think about what services we could be potentially offering right now that would help build something for the future, it's like to help you like weather and sustain the future. You know, we did ask the question of, you know, what about like online trainings about like, um, like how to, how to sell your product online. So I think that's at least, you know, one example where like, you know, hopefully at the developer level, we're still like stirring the ideas in people's heads about like what could the future hold and like um, what, what do you need in order to adapt to a new future that might feature more pandemics um, is to like be ready for this kind of situation to come again. Uh, so be ready with like your online sales. Can you like, yeah, pivot to doing it online? Um, can you really sustain yourself that way? You know, certainly... That's, I mean, it's a really good question about like, how do the members see it right now? I mean, I'm sure that like for those who are just kind of, you know, you know depending on their co-op, maybe in some new ways, like maybe they got a loan for the first time from the credit union because they were trying to like make ends meet in a sudden way that they never had to before. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that will also like, you know, ch somewhat change the relationship that people have with their co-ops that they can really see. And I think this becomes all the more apparent in moments of crisis that we depend on our co-ops that like they exist to serve a need and in some ways they do it best when there is these unfortunate circumstances that we're facing because co-ops have always existed to kind of respond to what you might call market failure or just like capitalism as usual <laughs> you know that there's disposable people uh and, and, you know and, and lives unfortunately so we're always having to respond to that so hopefully there's like new relationships and new appreciation for the cooperative business model that goes forward and continues to drive greater and greater cooperation. Um, I hope that I hope that members can see that, <laughs> but that's my hope. Yeah, I definitely hope that it'll, you know, bring bring forth some sort of uh, more collective conscience. Because I think, you know, like I said, it's just really hard to like imagine what's what's going on outside of your own home right now, in spite of all the connectivity. I think. Right. And not get like total like Zoom fatigue or <laughs> go to meeting fatigue yeah. from like all these online meetings. Yeah. Well, anyway, thank you so much. Uh, you're 
answers have been really insightful uh, from from the developer perspective, definitely. Um, and it's good to hear about what's going on kind of in, in Georgia and other things you've heard about going on around the country. Did you have any last thoughts? Or? Well, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for, for the opportunity. And, you know, I'm always trying to like emphasize that like Southern cooperation is a distinctive type of cooperation. And I think that our response to the coronavirus will be likewise, I think in some ways like yeah, like our interconnectedness can be <laughs> a little bit less maybe so. And like in terms of like being hip to what is new in the cooperative space doesn't necessarily happen as much in the South. But I think that the need is especially stark and as such like the practices of cooperation are pretty well, uh, like well learned within the South. Mm -hmm. And I think it just kind of comes naturally in a lot of ways, to, you know, that like nobody had to ask the West Georgia Farmers Co-op, like, you know, you should really step up to help the kids. Like, they just knew that that's what needed to happen. So I think it's, I think it's really beautiful. Um, and yeah, I'm just happy to uh, hopefully lift up some of what's happening. Great, thank you so much, Matthew.